Hey everybody, welcome to uh, this week's episode of the Rainmaker Show, and uh, we're ready to have Chris Morrow on board and and Patty. Uh, we're going to have some interesting discussions about the Rainmaker course material and give you a chance to meet Chris and uh, have him introduce himself and his business a little bit and talk about the impact that the Rainmaker programs had on his business and his practice. And and so, uh, Chris, lead us off. Uh, tell us a little bit about your business, how long you've been in practice, and what's going on. Thanks, Greg. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Quick backstory. Uh, got started as a personal trainer way back in 2001. That's actually where I met my wife. So I started out the big box commercial gym. Hmm. So uh, just fell in love with fitness. I always had an athletic spirit through basketball, and that transferred into the gym fitness lifestyle. So that's how I got my start. Fast forward six years later, uh, I found CrossFit in 2007. That kind of lit my entrepreneurial fire. Mm. And uh, I knew growing up, I always wanted to do something that I loved to do, not do something that I had to do. So if I, I found that as the marrying of my athletic and entrepreneurial spirit. So went from there. I'm from California, decided to move to South Dakota to start my first gym. And knowing what I know now, I kind of did it like a copycat model because I didn't know how to run a business at the time. So I got into it like most guys, just doing it off passion and fun and desire and always was craving and looking for structure, for professionalism to really build a future. Fast forward then, I found Mad Labs probably originally in 2010. On the journal, I saw Patty's interview uh, that they posted, but never really did anything about it at the time. And then I actually came about it again two years ago. So in July of 2016, I officially found Mad Lab again, and I was ready, so I jumped on board. And I've been doing it ever since. So I've been a part of three startup micro gyms, two that I've owned. This, uh, this third one is called CPM Fitness, my current gym. And we have two locations and a pretty sizable corporate contract. And uh, that's where I'm at today, if that makes sense. Right. Well, that's an exciting story. Wow, congratulations. Uh, just a lot of work went into that, I'm sure. Holy moly. Mellow, two well, weeks in a row, eh, buddy? You're like our, uh, uh, almost like our Joan, uh, Joan Rivers, is it? Yeah, you know, I'm trying to be like the, the uh, <laughs> communication and enrollment ambassador, probably. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hardest, hardest working man in Mad Lab right here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're up. Yeah, well, tell us a little bit about your experience with the Rainmaker program, how you came about considering that. Uh, what was like kind of going through that? What's the effects of it? Yeah, so I've always, because I had this entrepreneurial passion, I've always studied sales and leadership and personal development and uh, never and what I always had to do was take the content and try to translate it to the gym and industry which was a difficult thing but what got me on the rainmaker was it was specifically designed the content the language the method for the gymming industry and what I was looking for in professionalizing my gyms my coaches and my industry so that's one of the main things that I got out of it that I really appreciate about it, even as I continue to study and learn and evolve from it. Yeah, it's been a tough, uh, it's a tough road. The fitness industry has got itself in a little bit of a corner. Um, I don't know if it's driven just by the consumer or by the way that fitness professionals present themselves, right? This commodity idea. Um, it's tough, it's yeah. Pseudo professional. A lot of hobbyists are in the fitness field or going to work in the fitness. Uh, personal training continues to grow as a profession, clearly. Um, but yeah, that sales component of it uh, is a place for professionalism to be developed and and shown, right? And I don't think a lot of, of the gym owners and the coaches realize that the sales part is, is where they get to present themselves as a professional. Yeah, I agree. How does the uh, program you think translate that? What is it about, you know, winging it in a, in a conversation with somebody who calls you up on the phone and says, yeah, I want to get the prices for your gym. 
right? And you tell them it's three thousand dollars, and they say, "All right, thanks. I'll think about it. I'll call you later." Right? Well, what is it about the program that really gets you more on the professional presentation side? Well, I think just learning the psychology behind people's decision-making habits, you know, buying habits is crucial because once you you know what the script is in their head, because everybody does do pretty much the same thing, even though they, they want us, everybody wants essentially the same thing and they all actually go about it in the same way. It's just, if, if a coach knows the script of how that conversation is gonna go, then you have a lot more control and honestly, a lot less pressure on yourself to try to sell them. I think one of the big things that I've learned in sales is it's not our job to convince somebody to do something. It's our job to help them sell themselves. I mean, that's really what sales is. It's, it's helping them make a decision. It's not on us to do that. And the big takeaway that I learned was just the filtering process. I always thought I could help and save everybody just by my enthusiasm and passion and willingness to help, but that's not the case. There's a lot of people that you can't say the right thing to the wrong person, but you you can say the right thing to the right person. And that's where if you know what to say and how to say it and when to say it, you can be a lot more successful, a lot more confident. And, and then you can actually attract more people than you would have otherwise because you have those skills in hand. And we, we you guys always talk about translating it to the workout world, you know, People don't know how to snatch when they come into this if they've never done a barbell. So for coaches, it's like teaching their clients how to snatch is us learning the format and the language and staying in order so that you can help them make the right decision. Hmm. Uh, well said. We can interject yeah, real quick there. Sorry to interrupt. You know, people are saying like uh, you hear sometimes out there like, I don't want my coach to sell them or what is there to sell? I mean, if you're, you're, uh, you know, doing a lot of marketing and you're running a group on ramps and stuff like that, you know, there's, there's always a sale going on, but if you really want to sell something that works, i.e. the people don't leave and they pay you lots of money to have a good life, right? There's a, there's an enrollment, there's a communications portion there that is just basically getting to the truth for you to really eloquently find out what their needs are and for you to be able to see if there's a fit with you and them, and that communication and that enrollment piece is massive. If you have uh, no idea how to uh, position that, um, it's going to bite you somewhere. It might not even bite you. You might even you might even get that deal that day. But what I really found, Greg, from taking your course was the communication is so clean that you're setting up the expectation for the next 30 years in that meeting. You know, this is how this thing's going to work between me and you. Every day you come in. And here's what my here's what I expect of you. This is what you can expect from me. And uh, it just sets a groundwork for retention there and for how your relationship works forever. That I, I, I think that gets missed sometimes that people think they're just selling. You're actually establishing a relationship, a bond, a trust, commitment, and honesty there in that uh, that that first um, interaction that uh, that carries you throughout the, the rest of that relationship. Huge, I think that's a key insight in that uh, for some reason, you know, unfortunately, many folks have this idea in their head that as sales people are in there in a sales transaction, they they have to a hundred percent closing rate, right? And if that doesn't does happen, there's something wrong with them or they've done something wrong. And and this is a terrible amount of pressure to put on yourself, uh, let alone if you're trying to build a quality practice um, with relationships that you want to be in professionally. There's going to be a lot of people you, you say no to. And so empowering the, the coach and the owner to recognize that sometimes no is the best answer uh, for the long-term health of the business is the key. And you have to figure out how to do that. And so we spend a lot of time, right, in that identity role psychology problem um, and uh, trying to help the coach and, and the athlete recognize that it's just a role responsibility uh, with a critical outcome that's yes or no and that's and then that's it you don't have to make it tougher than that i was going to ask you a question greg is i've been you know i've been you know we've been out there with our lead machine and we're looking at how how to get people to come in to find a coach for life and how you do it through advertising and you know you look at some of the marketing techniques out there 
it just feels some of it feels really dirty. One of them, uh, you know, it's like uh, you got a free challenge. Come on in, and they show up, and uh, it's like, no, it's not a free challenge. It's uh, actually a six hundred dollar deposit. It goes towards something else. Like uh, I, that occurred to me as like selling to the inner child, or even that one. Come on in, you're gonna lose twenty pounds, and you know, just how you set up that first day a relationship carries through or echoes through. And you know, if, if a, someone felt tricked uh, or somehow bait and switched. Uh, that might not even show up that day, but it's going to show up somewhere. You want to talk a little bit about that or selling to the parent, the inner child, the, that, that whole piece. I think a lot of people get a lot of value out of, out of that, mm -hmm. how that might relate to, you know, essentially kind of tricking someone or, um, you know, not being completely forthright with what your marketing practices that brought in this person sitting in front of you. Certainly. Uh, it's about? a good point. And again, it's something that we spend a lot of time on the, the system that, that were using, you know, comes out of some of the sand for sales Institute material I learned. And from that particular uh, process, I learned about transactional analysis. And so I got deeper into the, the notions and principles of transactional analysis, uh, some work done by Dr. Eric Byrne years ago. Uh, and, and so it's a really nice model to help understand personality and how personality is constructed. And they use this parent adult child ego state model to help us understand how our personality is constructed. And so you have the, these emotional compartments and these um, intellectual compartments and, you know, security and protection and, and uh, needs and ambitions. And, and these things have seats in each of these ego states. And so uh, often marketers and, and we spend the, you know, the, the morning of the first day of the course addressing this problem that the consumers pretty jaded against a lot of modern marketing and sales techniques, uh, which are really set up kind of bait and switchy or what we call hooking the child ego state, right? Appealing just to emotion in the short term, try to make an expedient decision without really thinking through uh, the logical and rational consequences of that decision. And so this is a uh, right. that would be the whole countdown timer and you better still up now and putting that sense of urgency and, and all, all of that is to hook the child, as I yes. could say. They're trying to hook, yeah, continue. Hook, yeah. they're trying to hook this child in like a grifter or a gypsy, right? Um, that's how con men and con women work. Uh, they try to set up an emotional situation uh, and then take advantage of that. Now, emotion is the seed of value. That's why it works so powerfully is that our emotions are so powerful, our need to emotion is so intrinsic, you know, to our being that we're easily marked to um, take be taken advantage of. And so, you know, the system we're trying to that we put together is trying to combine the idea of the emotional needs with the logical, rational aspect of it. So all the ego states can be involved in the ultimate decision. And we think that's the only ethical sale that's that's there. Um, because you need to combine both of these things, emotion and the objective logical reason to do so in real time and help the consumer work through that so that they can come out feeling good about their decision. Because that's what buyer's remorse is, right? Buyer's remorse is when, you know, you use a bait and switch or some emotional hook and then the person leaves the, the transaction and then they get to go think about it logically and rationally and realize they made a rash decision, call you up and cancel the order. That's one of our um, explanations for buyer's remorse. And so uh, our time is too precious. Their time is too precious to try to run through all of this and waste all of this time and energy um, doing that. We're just going to deal with it right from the beginning uh, and get to the, get to the truth. Yes. No, they should proceed. Right. And Chris, you're, um, you got you and Annie and then you got, was it mother? Mother Plucker, Mother Plucker, and uh, who's your who's the fourth in this? Because we're doing the, the black doing the three old black mamba training, the black mamba. <laughs> um, so they've done the old the old old course, not the revamp one. We got everybody into that new one. I think I think there was a couple of technical issues there we had last week. Um, are you guys going through that uh, the new course now? I'm going through it now, and I, I stopped when the technical stuff. Cause I was doing it this weekend, yeah. But they've gone, they've all gone through the old yeah. course. Um, 
it really helped them too. You know, same thing, just developing a, a method and structure and then just the filtering thing too. You know, when we get to the point where we're meeting with somebody, we know that eight, we're 80% of the way there. It's just having them feel comfortable and building trust. And then it's just a home run. So, I mean, they're definitely the right kind of coaches for this type of model. So, Greg, I don't want to take away the reins from you. I'm going to pass the, the mic all back to you. I just wanted to ask, because we're going through, Chris is in the beta test of the uh, 301, which is uh, team building and leadership. So um, what is our, uh, what is your, how do you foresee that? How, so far, it's 14 weeks in a row it'll be. And it's going to be concentrating on um, on what exactly, Greg? Maybe maybe you want to just maybe fill people in on what the three hundred one is. I don't know if you've talked about that at all yet. No, I haven't really discussed that too much. Uh, the Rainmaker, you know, again, series is designed to get everybody on the same page um, with you know a basic understanding of how the communication process uh, works, so that you know everyone's on board with the kind of culture that you're trying to build. And so the culture that you're building in your practice, you know, starts with the sales transactions. And so once you get your team on board with the idea of, okay, this is how we're going to communicate with the people in our community to try to find and, and develop long-term relationships with folks that we want to work with, that want to work with us and understand our culture and build into it. Uh, we can translate that common that common ground into a deeper team building process uh, and get more ownership in, in the cultural building and in the business um, role responsibilities and clarifying those because uh, there's nothing that tears apart a, a business faster than you know confusion and chaos about role responsibility and who's supposed to be doing what and because uh, when you get more than you know, one person in a room, you have politics, and you have different needs and, and different emotional coping skills and different ways to think about things. And, and if you don't have a model or a system for harnessing that um, and channeling it, uh, it'll tear, the, it'll tear the, the business apart, which, which we see over and over again, right? I mean, one of the reasons, you know, you're doing what you're doing, Patty, with the Mad Lab Group is, you know, trying to go back into this market that's literally cannibalized itself um, because of because of the problems that exist when you get more than one or two people you know in a room together and they've got to they've got to figure out how to work synergistically and cooperatively and if they can't it's going to be over pretty soon it's just going to be ugly so you need both skills you know greg you know, it's 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 funny because at a previous crossfit that i was at or micro gym that i was at my second one of the three, it was interesting because I, I came from an owner role, owning a gym and then sold the gym. And then I got hooked up with another startup gym, but this time I was in a managerial role type thing, kind of the Moosecock general manager type role. And we all got along really great. And I got along with the owner personally, but then what happened was I would see things in my view that I remember as an owner, but I wasn't an owner in an owner role. And I wanted to bring this up actually, it's interesting. So I would follow the owner, the general, because he was in charge. And I was hoping he would ask me for my opinion because my, my instincts told me, never tell your boss or somebody that you personally like what they're doing wrong without them asking you. You know what I mean? So like from a leadership perspective, he would make decisions or make non-decisions on things that I would have done different, but I felt out of place bringing that up to his attention or starting that conversation, basically saying, you know, I would do it this way. You know, you're kind of wrong in my eyes. I would like, you know, do you know what I'm trying to say? I never wanted to tell somebody they're doing something wrong without them asking me. So then for me, the big learning lesson for me was, I was always going to be very, very uh, vigilant about asking for criticism, about seeing people's ideas and takes and, and getting it more of on a collaborative level so that I wasn't being, they would help me with my blind spots when I didn't feel comfortable helping somebody else with their blind spots without them asking. 
Top right. down, I, it's a huge problem. You know, the, the top down hierarchical um, model is it's it's not very effective most of the time. Uh, and and once somebody set up, you know, it's called dictatorship, right? Once somebody sets themselves up at the top of the pedestal, and is, and is either giving off the idea that they can't be challenged or held accountable for their decisions, and or the people working with them don't feel empowered. Uh, to to say, hey, you know, I got some suggestions here. I got some ways, different ways to think about this, uh, and that the trust that's necessary for that to occur. If that if that's not there, it starts the insidious um, undermining of the organization. And and if that stuff isn't dealt with in a straightforward way, uh, as soon as it as soon as it shows up, um, you start getting resentment, and bitterness, and uh, back backsided questioning and and little groups get formed and uh, you know it, it's just a matter of time everyone will be nice on the surface for a while they'll be friendly mm-hmm. go out to lunch and sound happy and but underneath it's rotting it's a terrible thing Hap- yeah. it's cliche at this point you know it's all it just gets a and again it's because of the lack of clarity and role responsibility the lack of trust between team members um, the lack of faith in how to embrace diversity under constraints and that you get some people that are all trustworthy and trusting each other and understand their roles and the context of those roles, uh, that they're trying to meet a particular mission and that's well-defined, um, man, that's that's when the magic happens. That's what the lightning you want to capture in the bottle. But other than that, it's just a group of people meandering along, kind of doing what they do. And uh, you don't have that high synergy that team that team creates, and it's a it takes work. It's, it's a difficult thing to capture, and often not everybody's equipped for it. They aren't. Some people really need to be by themselves, working on their own, and that's fine. They just can't be part of the team. And so, if you want a high producing, high synergy team, uh, that's what Rainmakers uh, trying to help owners and coaches form. I'm really, I'm really stuck with that part. Getting the whole, Getting team, the whole together. team together. Sounds like we Sounds got like a, a ring for announcement. I can't hear it. Yeah. Okay. I think it's. Uh, I think it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. No, it's me. <laughs> it might be mellow. Yeah. No. I mean, getting everybody on on board and getting all that flushed out. Um, you know, we I, in Vancouver, we kind of did it the old school, the old school way. Um, and it took, a, you know, it took us years to flush everybody out. And we still have to continually do that. Um, but w- I wish we had had that training back in 2007 or eight. I had to go. I went through some really hard yards getting the wrong people off the bus um, back then before we really, we really knew. Right. It was I think it was kind of like ah, anybody can coach. Here's a wide open. <laughs> carte blanche come on in do your thing you know what i mean it was like that was very traumatic for us to, not to get everybody completely on board with what the the mission was and how the, the be, behaviors had to be and what worked and what didn't work so yeah we went through that the hard way yeah and so i think uh, mad labs you know got a nice model it's building uh to tr- try to streamline that and you know take some of the pain out of it uh as well as uh shorten shorten the time period it might take to formulate the team synergy. Um, because again, the, the way a lot of current businesses might be coming into Mad Lab um, is they have a lot of baggage and dead wood and dysfunction already. And the, the hardest thing about role responsibilities of ownership is the decision to cut people from the team. And sometimes that's got to happen. And so the owner has to feel empowered and supported in that process um, by one, understanding the team task and their role in that. Um, And that despite the emotional aspects of that, it's really best for everybody um, when that happens. And and hopefully you can save relationships and part, you know, part friends and, and that's fine. That's always the goal, but that can't, it doesn't happen all the time. People get mad. What are you going to do? Gotta keep moving. Uh, so, what if we had to say, you know, our uh, what's the, I guess the, the operational cadence 
every week or every month with um, at your gym, Chris, with uh, Rainmaker 201, Rainmaker uh, um, 301, and then like the monthly reinforcement one. What what does that look like in your gym? Are you guys sitting down and doing, uh, what does your meeting structure look like? So I have weekly meetings with my two full-time coaches. One's on Tuesday, one's on Wednesday. And then we have, we all get together on Thursdays. And so there's essentially with the full-time coaches, there's two meetings a week. And then we still have a big handful of utility coaches. We'll do that once a month with all the full and part-time coaches. Excellent. That's, so. the role. That's the role of the leader. The, the leader sets the vision, um, helps build the task, and then empowers and continues to invest in the staff and the coaches to be able to execute their role responsibilities. And the material that we're talking about is it's sophisticated. It's going to take a couple of years to really learn and embrace a lot of these strategies and tactics and, and overcome some of the, you know, personality and, and um, trust issues and, and to, to build the team. And so it really is an investment on everybody's part, but I think if you're authentic and sincere uh, I would tell you that a lot, most people want to want to work for an in an environment, a culture where sincerity and authenticity and full disclosure and transparency, vulnerability um, is expressed. And uh, it's a safe place to to explore and express your own professional needs. Um, and people want to work in cultures like that. I think they'll even take less money to find a place like that to, to work. You know, I mean, money can only take you so far. You need to make it. I mean, that's why we have the Rainmaker 201 program. We're going to show you how to make money doing this because you, you want to have a professional full-time career in this field. you got to make money. Um, but if you want to stay in it de for decades, man, you got to have a work culture you love going to and, and that you uh, feel a, a dynamic part of. Yeah, I think my biggest thing, one of my new things is, is getting those utility coaches on board in some shape or form. You know, the role is definitely defined with them, but – I want them understanding the language, the new model, you know, the way we introduce people, what to, how to troubleshoot when they see people on the floor, because they're, they're our part-time, you know, frontline. And so that's what I've been working on too, is enrolling coaches, kind of like how I'd pick off legacy members to do hybrid. It's, it's, it's the same idea with, with coaches is pick off the, the utility coaches enroll them in this new way of structure and thinking and behaving so that they can at least give us handoffs if they're not willing and able to jump in and start doing a lot more co personal coaching. So that's, that's my next thing is developing a cadence for those types of people. Basically there are second string essentially in basketball, there are bench and they're valuable. They're going to help win championships. The better your bench is. Big time. Well, it's getting almost to the end of our time, Greg. Anything else you wanted to throw out? Looks like he might be frozen up over there, is he? He looks froze. <laughs> he's either in, he's in a deep contemplative state over there, yeah, Chris. Yeah, the profile pic. <laughs> uh, so you're doing one sale. Are you doing a sales meeting a week, and then the leadership meeting every week? Are you going through, are you doing, are, is that what you're doing with your staff? Yeah, I mean, well, the, the new Greg Mack Friday meetings, that's, that's a new thing we're building yeah. in, but yeah, I'll do a once a week meeting with the coaches and then, and then we bring us all together on Thursday, discuss programming and, you know, housekeeping and then any hot topics. Do you but, sit down and go through your coach, go through their book, their client book and say, hey, 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 like you know, each one, what happened with this person, what yep. happened to that person? Yeah. We get a referral here. If this one hasn't been here for a while. How do we make a mistake there? All that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. We'll do that. We'll we'll look at their, their sales feed <clears> and then we'll we'll just scroll through the list and we'll see any troubleshooting. And if I find something throughout the week, I'll highlight it so that we both see it so that we just talk about it. But that's usually how we start. And then we'll you know, talk about how they're doing, how they're feeling, where they're going. And then, like you said, just try to solve any problems that are coming up before they start to fester. That's the big thing. That client, once they get the sales training and then we get this whole, the whole leadership and team building thing, then you, all you're doing is focusing on the clients and focusing on the continual 
um, retention and building up uh, from uh, building up your tribe with a, with a lot of the time it's referrals from those members you're already training, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's and that's basically the dream. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is 30 minutes in, Chris. I want to thank you so much, Brody, for for uh, being uh, such a big supporter and actually using all the tools. I mean, uh, if we were to create a franchise, I would say everybody should, you know, it'd be 100% mandatory to do the Rainmaker series, but uh, we we have them as options right now. So uh, we'll, uh, I appreciate you, you jumping on there, and I appreciate the, the success that you're having. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, and it's just, this is definitely the way to go, so... It is a, uh, it's a no brainer in my mind. All right, buddy. Love you. Thanks brother. Love big, you big signing off. Bye-bye.